However, there's a there is a deadline that's much closer to us, and uh, that is uh, paid poll workers. We need them. We need them for elections. It's going to take more than eight thousand to pull off this November five general election that's coming up. So we have called on uh, the one authority, the singular authority in the state, to talk about elections with the Secretary of State, Mac Warner. Mac, good morning to you, sir. How are you? Great to be with you guys, as always. Pleasure is ours, Mac. Where are you as, as we speak here? I am in Washington State. I'm out here doing granddad duty. I've got four grandchildren out oh. here, and this was the best time to, to come pay them a visit. So uh, we're having a great time out here. Mike Queen, who sets these up for us, uh, said to me, Mac would be uh, probably out west doing some granddad stuff. So good for <laughs> you, man. Are you enjoying it? Absolutely. It's just grandkids are just the greatest. You, you always hear about it. When you have them, uh, you realize they haven't been lying to you all these years. You get the best of everything with the grandkids and, uh, without some of that responsibility that uh, <laughs> we mm -hmm. had when we were parents. So in the Seattle part or the Spokane part? But this is actually Vancouver, so I'm really just north of uh, Portland, just across the river from Portland, Oregon. Okay. So it's very southern Washington. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. Uh, Mac, so uh, in January, when a new administration comes in, uh, you will be out of the office of Secretary of State. Are you going to do something else, or are you easing into retirement? See, I can relate to John and being out of work, uh, <laughs> you know, unemployed. So uh, we'll see what the, the future holds. I, I don't think I'm uh, ready to hang it up, and that retired just really isn't in my vocabulary. So we'll see what the good Lord has in store for me. Well, that's good. I have enjoyed the uh, eight years that uh, we've had you on the program and uh, your accessibility as an attorney general is admirable and has helped our show, and we greatly appreciate it, sir. So thank you. Well, you guys have always been great. Uh, you do such a great public service, as the topic is today, and that is getting the information out to people who need to know. And uh, so this is the – I can't believe today is August 1st. This is the National Poll Worker Recruitment Day, and uh, so that's what uh, – we're going to talk about here just a little bit, let people know how they can become a poll worker. Mm -hmm. And in the Berkeley County area, poll workers got a nice raise over the last uh, couple of elections. And that makes a big difference because you're spending, uh, in many cases, a full day out at Election Central. So it's nice to be compensated for it nice uh, and fairly as well. So, Mac, what's it take to become a poll worker for the first time if you've never done it and you find yourself... With some free time, maybe you're a best-selling author and you're between books and you've got a couple hours of the day you can spare. Well, I, I think you all might have some credit for getting that poll worker raise uh, because I think you all were talking about this. We did. And, uh, I think the commission listened. So uh, to answer your question, the best way there in Berkeley County is if you're a Democrat to get a hold of Tammy Offit and if you're a Republican, get a hold of Pam Brush because they are the county chairs. If you're in Jefferson County, the Democrat, it's Lee Coons, Republican, it's Gene Jacobs. Morgan County, it's Democrat Jim Hoyce and the Republican Susan Kessel. So those are your uh, county chairs for the major parties in the panhandle. And the best thing to do is get a hold of them, let them know of your interest, because those county chairs submit lists of potential poll workers to the county clerks, and then the county clerks pick and choose depending on where people live so they get the various precincts covered and so on. So that's the first way. The second way you can do it is simply go directly to the county clerk and let them know if you're interested. You can stop by in person. You can call their office. And then the third way is to come to our website, the Secretary of State's website, and that's govotewb.com. And it's a very easy form that you fill out. There's a link that says become a poll worker. You click on it, fill it out, and then we get that information to the county clerk. So you can see that all of this is funneled through the county clerk's office. They're the key to this. And um, the only requirements are you have to be registered to vote. You have to be 18 um, and uh, or 17, and you become 18 before the uh, November 5th. And I mentioned that because we emphasize young people getting involved. Barber County had 12 high school students last in the primary that worked as poll workers. Nice. That's great because we're building a bench for, for years to come. Um, and, and this whole effort is not just to recruit poll workers, but to retain the ones that we do have. And so for all your listeners, um, show, show these poll workers some love. You know, when you hear that they're working the polls or they want to become a poll worker or you go in on election day, thank them for doing that job because uh, 
they are the crux of the, the whole election process. It's, it's where that voter is casting that vote and making sure that it's done properly, that it's all uh, up and up, that there's no nefarious activities going on. And it is a rigorous day or a long day, but you do get compensated for it. So uh, let me just mention the, the money very, very quickly because sure. that is important, especially for a young person that uh, is perhaps doing this so they get money for a date or a, you know, a gas money, that sort of thing. The training itself is two hours, and you get paid anywhere from 35 to $50 for that. And then on the actual election day, you get paid anywhere from 250 to $300. So um, that's the, the process, and today is the national day that everybody across the nation is talking about this, and I appreciate you having me on to talk with your listener. Oh. Pleasure, sir. Are there established actual duties and responsibilities for a poll worker? I mean, we've been there, and it seems like you know, there's one person that kind of takes you to the, to the seat and that kind of thing. But are they? That, that's what the training is all about. That they have one person who's in charge, and then you have the the folks that check you in and actually make sure you get the right ballot for the, the precinct that you live in, live in, and so on. And see, that's in in the state we have over 900 ballot styles. I mean, the 900 different ballots depending on. You know, your house district, your senate district, your you know where you live, and uh, so on. Somebody across the street from you may have a different ballot than, than you do, and that's the importance of these poll workers is to know, you know, to make sure they check you in properly, have the right address, and uh, that that's why we cut off registrations 21 days prior to the election, so all that information can be entered into the system and validated, so we make sure you get the right ballot, and that's what these poll workers are trained to do. So yes, they, each poll worker has an assigned responsibility. Now sometimes during the day they will shift between so that you don't get stuck in the same thing all day. Uh, you have a slightly different look, you know, helping people to the ballot box and showing them where to put the, the paper ballot into the tabulator and that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, it really becomes kind of a social event when you're there working the polls. A lot of times they bring in potluck lunches or order pizzas and that sort of thing. So. There's, there's some fun that goes along with this as well. Is there a website people can go to to find out if they are registered? Yes, govotewv.com. That is the Secretary of State's website for all things election-related. So you can get your sample ballot there. You can check to see if you're registered. You can change your registration up to 21 days prior to the election. So uh, this, I know this seems early. We're about three months out from the election. But this is the time. There's a lot of interest right now with everything from the assassination attempt on former President Trump to Vice President Harris picking her running mate. There's a lot of interest right now. And so it's good that you all are talking about this. And people, now's the time to get that name, your name in to the clerk so they can get you on the list to, to get you trained when the time comes. And then we're all ready to go for that November election. Well, let's shift a little bit to politics. What uh, I know that you're... Uh quite the fan of President Trump. What do you think of his selection of running mate, J.D. Vance? Uh, I was up there at the convention, and a couple things about the convention. I thought it was very interesting in a number of ways. I think the GOP, the, the Republican Party, broadened its tent with that convention. They showed an awful lot of different faces and facets of uh, the electorate that you usually don't consider or you don't usually associate with the Republican Party. So that was one. I think when President Trump came in, to the arena at first he was subdued i think that was we were just days after the assassination attempt and so that was understandable i think it was exciting when he did bring out uh jd vance as his vice president uh, pick because of his youth uh, i think that showed a whole different uh side to the whole you know uh, argument that both presidential candidates at that time were uh in their 70s or 80s and uh they were old and so this brought a fresh face so I'm pleased. Now, J.D. Vance is uh, somewhat new uh, to the whole political arena. He's only 39 years old. Uh, I mean, I have a son that's almost that old. Uh, so there is, uh, let's, let's see how he weathers through the uh, campaign. So I'm excited. I'm thrilled about the, the choice. Uh, I think he is a, the future, a, a good person leading the GOP into the future. Um, so I, I'm excited about the, the prospects. Mac, former delegate Ken Reed, he was also a candidate for Secretary of State, is asking the Elections Office to investigate parallels between political contributions to boost the campaign of primary election winner Chris Warner, your brother, 
and state loans that were approved under Warner's oversight in his current role at the State Economic Development Authority. Uh, this was filed yesterday, as I understand it. And uh, my question is, does it go specifically through you and your office and the obvious conflict of interest between uh, you as the Secretary of State, your brother, who is a candidate to replace you uh, ultimately, and this investigation? How do you handle that? Sure. I, I'm glad you asked that because, uh, the, as I understand it, the complaint has been uh, filed through my office, which is the appropriate place that we have the right uh, uh process in place to investigate i for for various reasons one tangentially because chris is my brother uh i I stay out of this plus i don't get involved in the investigations myself anyway in fact we don't even talk about uh, the investigation so uh, i'm only mentioning that because i think it's open source that the the complaint was filed i also know that my brother responded with some uh, statement as well and so uh, saying that he's kept his distance and done everything according to law. So uh, we'll let the process play out. Uh, it's in the right hands and will be handled appropriately, and uh, we'll see how all that washes out. Does that go through your legal counsel of your office, Dick Kersey, or is that at an entirely different investigative level? We have an investigative office. Uh, Kim Mason heads up our investigators. Uh, general counsel is Dave Cook uh, in my office, and, of course, Dick Kersey is my um uh, chief of staff, and he was the former uh, chief legal counsel. So all of those people are involved and uh, will, as I said, make sure that it's done properly. Mac, I want to ask you a couple of questions in regards to a comment you made about poll workers, and you had said that there were 12 uh, kids from a high school. Was it uh, Philip Arbor? Yes. Is that what you said? Yeah. Who uh, had uh, worked as poll workers. And in this state, I believe twice we have set records for the youngest elected, uh, elected officials. Uh, a couple of uh, young people, one from around this area, Sarah Blair, who was uh, elected to the House of Delegates. And as I understand it, that was later uh, broken uh, by, I think, Josh Hig- Higginbotham, if I have the name uh, correct, uh, too. Uh, talk to me about young people's involvement in politics in West Virginia. And I know you also had a very successful drive to get seniors in high school who would be 18 by the next election registered to vote. Tell me why you think that is. Well, a lot of this is attributed to Senator Jennings Randolph, former uh, senator from West Virginia, who uh, was responsible for getting the 26th Amendment passed to the Constitution, and that is uh, that allows 18-year-olds the right to vote. So West Virginia has been front and center since 1971 when that was uh, passed. Uh, as a state that's forward thinking with the youth and so on. And that was a 29 year battle. He just didn't give up. He started that right after Pearl Harbor and fought it for 29 years before he got the rest of the country to uh, come on board with his thinking. And so, um, following from that, it wasn't just giving the 18 year olds the right to vote, but it gave them the right to run for office and be involved politically and so on. So, West Virginia's had this um, sense about it that it cares about young people, wants to get them involved. And so we've continued that uh, legacy by giving Jennings Randolph awards to high school students uh, and to the high schools that get 85% or more of their potentially registered or their uh, eligible uh, students to, to register to vote. And so, as you mentioned, Sarah Blair, of course, out there from Eastern Van Edel set this record for being the youngest legislator ever elected in the history of the United States. And then Caleb Hanna from down near Webster County the youngest African-American ever elected to a state legislature from here in West Virginia. So we've got this proud legacy. We're all a part of it now. And uh, it's important to just encourage young people to get involved. And I'll give you an example, okay? I, I wasn't born with a cell phone in my hands. So today's students, I mean, they can get these cell phones at the youngest of ages. And they, they're aware of the power of um, this, this gadget that we hold in our hands. But that's what... A lot of these legislatures and the Congress are wrestling with is what's the proper control over this? And artificial intelligence, generative uh, AI, uh, where is it going? And what are the proper uh, restrictions we should have on Google and Facebook and social media with regards to data? I think somebody that's 25, 30 years old may be in a better position to make some of those judgment calls or at least guide the congressional committees uh, through what is a proper remedy of balancing uh, privacy versus not putting restrictions on these private companies to expand their 
the growth of these uh, uh, social media companies and uh, the use of intelligence. So um, that's why I want young people involved. I think West Virginia is doing a great job. I think we have about 10 people under the age of 30 uh, in our state legislature. And uh, so I think we're doing it right here in West Virginia, and I just want to keep that ball rolling by encouraging people to register, to vote, and to run for office. And to sign up to be poll workers, too. Great way to get started, right? So should we be concerned about election security in November in West Virginia, Mac, with uh, what we keep hearing about security breaches, data breaches, uh, the uh, generative AI, and deep fakes? Well, we should always have our critical thinking hat on. We should always be watching. If something comes across social media and it doesn't work or sound right or sounds too good to be true, any of that, yes, we should be critical and think before you link. Don't click on something and then get involved with a a hacking and so forth. So the answer is yes, we should always be concerned. We shouldn't be overly concerned. We should be very proud of what we've done here in West Virginia to secure elections. And as today's topic shows, it begins with these poll workers making sure the process is followed properly as the votes are cast, our machines are not connected to the Internet, and we get results on election night. That's the importance of using that electronic pen on a ballot that can be electronically tabulated, but we follow it up with checks and balances. We have an audit system of the paper ballot to make sure that it coincides with the electronic tabulation. So we have very secure elections here in West Virginia. We lead the nation in election integrity and security. I've been asked four times to testify in front of Congress about the success we've had in West Virginia. So we should all be proud of that. And again, it goes right back to making sure that we have sufficient poll workers, trained poll workers. And I, again, give a shout out to the clerks. They are that critical junction where all of this comes together. And they are the ones responsible for each county's election and then getting those results into me as Secretary of State. Is there any chance that the vote totals in West Virginia can be electronically manipulated by a bad actor? Is it possible? I think anything is possible, but no, the answer is no. It hasn't happened yet. We haven't seen, we haven't had any instances where there's been a discrepancy between that tabulated vote and the hand counted. The, the couple of cases where that happened, when we went back and checked, it was the hand count that was improper, not the tabulated. So our machines are not connected to the Internet, and I think everybody in West Virginia can rest assured that our elections are safe. I can't speak for the other states, but I can speak for West Virginia and assure people that our elections are safe and secure. Is there a budget for publicizing that, putting people's minds at ease to say that we have the secure voting procedure? Well, we're doing it right now with this kind of conversation. Uh, There isn't a budget specifically for that. The SEC, the State Elections Commission, uh, gets just a token amount of money uh, to spend for public education uh, each year, and we do spend that. Um, But uh, the the main thing is, one, participating participating in the elections. And the best way is to become a poll worker because you're on the inside and you see that the machines don't touch the Internet. You see the... Uh, checks and balances and the the tabulation, the audits that are done. Uh, And that's why I encourage people, if you have a question about the integrity of the election, go work a poll. And I think 99% of your concerns are going to be washed away. So um, I I just can't emphasize enough, participating in the process is the best way to gain confidence in the process. I was asked to ask you about the Mingo County results uh, from, I guess, the previous election, Mac. Is there any update on that? That was supposed to be uh, in front of a judge in a court uh, in mid-July, and it was postponed. Or, or uh, So I think that is yet uh, to come down the pike, uh, and that will be decided in the court. See, once these elections are certified, then I don't have the authority to go in and overturn it or call for a new election. Only a judge can. And so the judge wants to make sure that, the evidence comes into court, into open court, under sworn testimony that, you know, an impropriety did occur and the impropriety was sufficient that it may have uh, overturned the election. That's usually the standard the judges look at before they call for a new election. So I think we're all on hold to stand by to see what evidence is produced uh, in the courtroom and then what the judge decides. Yeah, text I just got said 95% voter turnout. Wouldn't that be great, huh? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, Mac, about a minute left. Uh, sell it uh, to the uh, folks listening about becoming a poll worker for the first time or renewing your previous experience. It, it's very easy to do. Let a county uh, party chair know of your interest is the first way. The second way is to go to the county court yourself. Go let the county clerk know of your interest. You can do that even with a phone call. And the county court or uh, clerks typically have a, a website you can get on and do it that way. The easiest way, I think, is to go to our website, Secretary of State's website, which is govotewb.com. And there's a, the very first thing you see is become a poll worker. Click on that link. It's a very easy, easy user-friendly form to fill out, and then we will get that information to the county clerk. So um, to everybody, again, show these poll workers some love. Let them know you appreciate what they do. They are, what, uh, the, they are the front line to make sure the elections are run properly. And uh, we appreciate everybody who signs up and becomes a poll worker. Mac, we appreciate your time. And uh, it's coming up on uh, 7 o'clock on the West Coast. So go have some breakfast with those grandkids whenever they wake up. <laughs> Sounds good. Great talking to you all. Thanks. Thank you, Mac. Secretary of State Mac Warner at uh, 